Hi, everybody. Hope you're well. Thanks for joining me. Um, sorry, once again, as always, to keep you waiting. I usually go about 20 minutes late because uh, just like tonight, I usually tend to look at the subject matter or whatever it is I'm going to talk about and spend about 15 minutes trying to figure out how I'm going to start talking about it. So I did the same tonight. I have a, a big subject, as you can see in the title, Descendants of the Dragon, Demographics, Immigration and the Future of Civilization. And uh, I've been wanting to talk about it for a while. So, yeah. Uh, so firstly, thanks for joining me. Feel free to subscribe for as long as the YouTube channel lasts. I'm going to have to set up a rumble or something. I feel like the plug will get pulled on this eventually. Um, speaking of which, I do have super chats enabled as well. Uh, no pressure. And I don't know if they'll last for long anyway. So, um, But they're active for now. So it's an option. Um, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk through this whole subject. I have an article written on it. It's linked in the bio or the, sorry, the description of this video, if you want to take a look at it as we go. I'm basically going to, um, and thank you for the sound check, sound check chat just there. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm going to read through it and basically sort of uh, get into it that way because I, I was trying to open up extra sources and figure out how to go about it. And uh, I actually have a whole, I have a whole article written basically, which is a template to just go by. Um, but I'll start by sort of introducing the topic in a way um, before going through it. Now, it, the article does, have, or the essay has an introduction of its own as well. But um, so, yeah. Oh, and just one side note as well for the chat, because I know a lot of you come here for the chat and you enjoy kind of backing and forthing on current affairs. Um, there's been loads going on in Ireland at the moment. Most of my audience are Irish. And I want to talk about that stuff, and I will probably tomorrow start talking about some of the goings on of the last week. The rate of things happening at the moment is um, the velocity is fairly high, and so um, I kind of I've I've been wanting to get back to current affairs, but there's this subject that keeps coming up for me every time I stream. Almost this subject is something I'm hitting on briefly, and I find myself um, telling you that I'll I'll do a video on this just to give my full spiel on it. Um, so in a sense, um, it's kind of in the way. It's a fascinating subject. I hope you all enjoy it, and I hope you stick around if you have the time, because it's not just. I don't think it's just what you think it is. You know, um, there's a, there's there's so much to it. It's it's not just a case of, uh, as the title suggests, China doesn't really do immigration. Therefore, the you know the obvious extrapolations from that. There's there's loads of detail in it. It's the kind of thing that there should be a lot more content on. I think in the kind of dissident right wing sphere in the West or whatever. And I think there's a little bit of a lack of it in my view, and it's not talked about enough. It's not mentioned enough. Other subjects, probably some you can imagine are talked about a lot in the West, um, but this isn't. And it's a, it's a really big um, blind spot. And again, I know people are somewhat aware of it, but the detail, there should be more detail. That's what I'm doing here. Um, so yeah. Um, it's about the immigration and demographic question in China, but it, there's so much more to it because there's there's something that Niall Ferguson, a historian and academic columnist, has sort of described as Cold War II and plenty of other academics and essayists and, and, and uh, kind of American institutional figures have are, are, are sort of obsessed with this and they're talking about it all the time. And then this kind of, um, if, it, if that's the institutional, let's say, Western economic, um, I hate to use the word paradigm, but par paradigm, if, it, if it's the institutional, sorry, if it's the institutional view uh, and uh, something that they're obsessing over and they spend a lot of ink on it, uh, I, I feel like the sort of shadow narrative in the West, which is the dissident right, populist right, whatever you want to call it, um, populist, conservative, nationalist right is really the other view in the west and um, doesn't spend a fraction of the time on this and so i think there's a mismatch there um i, I don't know are you laughing at me if you're using the word paradigm there but uh so yeah um so if you think of it as a cold war too like the west had a you know has had a trajectory of this kind of liberal um battle with the illiberal world for you could argue centuries, but definitely, you know, there was the Russian, uh, the Russian state before 
leading up to World War II, which was going to kind of be the third Rome and all of that. It was this kind of European identitarian, Christian identitarian state, illiberal monarchy, all of that had notions about itself in this civilizational sense. Um, and the West sort of with Crimea and all of these, uh, like in the 18th century and on from there sort of had the daggers out for, and when I say the West, I mean the Anglo sort of, uh, Anglo-American West or whatever, had the daggers out for Russia. And then the, you could say the same was tr true of the Axis powers, obviously in World War II, obviously they were illiberal. And uh, following from that, you had the Soviet Union, which is, I suppose you could say Russia again, different in a way. Um, and there was this kind of Cold War, which is a very interesting subject as well from, let's say, a dissident right, contemporary dissident, dissident right point of view. Um, but now we have obviously China and uh, lots has been said about China with the 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 advance of China and all of this stuff and that they are they're an authoritarian state and they are this and they are that and they eat bats or whatever else it is. You know, the narratives about China, the sort of digital totalitarian society, sort of strange and alien and all of this. Um, but yeah, I think there's more to it. I think that's that's obviously a Western view to kind of paint the paint China out to be the sort of alien, scary, weird thing. And of course, in certain senses, it is culturally to us and politically as well. They don't follow our tradition in the West. But the view that's being put forward by the American neoliberal state is sort of a bit cartoonish and it's in their interests to sort of fight it as a as a as a as a civilizational opponent, effectively. So, like I say, you have Russia, you have effectively Germany, then you have the Soviet Union and all of that. The the great um, moral, political, and economic battle, effectively, of the 21st century, this is obviously nothing new, but it's the spin on it that I want to give you, I, I think is new and a bit novel. Um, that is the uh, That is the battle, so to speak, for the 21st century. And again, it's not really a question, of, and this is relevant, but it's not really a question of battleships or drone technology or AI and all of this kind of stuff. That's relevant too. My, you know, it's not necessarily my idea, but the, the thing I'm trying to stress and put out there with this essay and this video tonight um, is that uh, I'm just kind of half reading the chat as I speak to you. Sorry, it's a bad habit. Um, is that um, it's a lot of it is center, and I think the let's say the American like the the center CSIS whatever they call it people like Niall Ferguson, the Hoover Institute, all of these all of these uh, voices, uh, you know Radio Free Europe or Asia and all of that, um, they are um, focusing much more on the immigration aspect and the race aspect and the ethnic aspect or whatever cultural. The idea of China as a, and I'll open up a couple of sources on this that are great. Maybe I should just get going. Um, that are increasingly seeing China as as that's define that's defining their what they are. So it's no longer an idea that China is a communist threat because that was what the story, let's say, that was given during the Cold the Cold War, which is that the reason Russia was a threat was partially because it's a liberal yes but it was specifically communism was sort of the boogeyman and it was the idea of communism the idea of that economic model or the political uh control that nexus that they had was stifling and bad and everything else or so they were trying to put forward an argument the likes of ronald reagan and all these other neocon or whatever academics they were trying to make the argument that not just that we are better at accumulating resources and we are better morally but that our our regime our model of civilization effectively uh, it, well i suppose it is that is that it's more moral and that it's better at uh, for producing resources um and because of that it's the better system effectively they're making a case for their own side of things um and and spelling out how Communism is doomed. A lot of people were saying that, you know, eventually it'll fall apart and all of that. And of course it did. But um, now it's the idea that China is this sort of ethno state uh, and it, and it's closing itself off and it's doomed, et cetera, et cetera. Meanwhile, in China, the discourse there is the, the exact opposite. 
and the fascinating thing is that you know i think anyone who's sort of sentient at this point i mean people like Nell ferguson who i'm going to mention quite a bit these are intelligent people i just question how truthful they've been maybe being about like how they're influenced and in they're obviously paid and institutional figures but um kind of kissinger type people acolytes or whatever but um it's hard to see how they they have any legitimacy here uh, like I, I and i'm going to make this argument how china is 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 um destined to win this second cold war um and and not only is it going to win a, a second cold war like a 30 year period of competing ideas or civilizations or countries but that this also plugs into the a greater turning of the wheel which is maybe a 500 year or a thousand year span long where china was of course uh, a great civilization you know up a thousand years ago um declined the west rose and this is a turning of that wheel it's much bigger than a 20 30 year kind of political cycle and uh, this massive thing is happening and it, it is a lot of it is locked in on the immigration question which is my gig that's what i talk about that's what i do um i know i am rambling but to to finish up my introduction we'll say pretty long introduction is that this is relevant to us because our whole as people who are against mass immigration and let's say nationalist and conservative and populist and all of this in the west this is extremely relevant to us we are we are sort of like small little things swimming around in this ma massive current and this is the current is the rise of china as a nationalist state um vying for multipolar sort of hegemony there's another one of those words um and ultimately will become maybe the not the uni power but could become the leading global sort of um power uh, and uh the west will go into decline and sort of turn in on itself and fall apart and get it's going to get pretty crazy and uh this is part of it and uh also it's relevant for um rhetorical reasons for us because of course and this is what bothers this is why i want to put this out there more because i see a lot of talking heads and roving reporters and streamers and all of this stuff constantly kind of making arguments and they're talking about and and like you know reasons why the west shouldn't be replaced and all of this and, and they're fighting back against these arguments that for example in ireland we always hear that ireland has a, a moral and a legal obligation to take in millions of migrants for like no apparent reason just a general moral and le legal obligation apparently it's moral so post-world war ii ideology and uh it's it's legal so uh, we we're signed up to migration pacts and 1951 charter on the rights of refugees this that and the other you name it right people love to put forward all these pieces of paper effectively and uh one of the big arguments obviously when he comes to china and I'll, I'll read it through my essay is that um you know they're signed up to a lot of that stuff too they're a big country they're modern and uh they're not doing it and i i don't know why that point when people are sort of debating the immigration question with regimeists we'll say why not bring that up like what can they say back they can just say oh well china is an author authoritarian state so that's not a good point it, that's not enough it is a good point it's 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 an indisputable point and it's very hard for them to kind of get around like why if china does that and not only do they do it they really don't get challenged no one talks about it like i say these nell ferguson types do but it's not out there in general public discourse and uh it has to be talked about more so um i see some of you are super chatting there i'm going to go back over those at once in a while maybe i'll go back over them all but thank you um so let me just screen share and we i'll read through my essay and i'll open up the sources we'll watch a couple of videos as well as we go so let me just um start here so descendants of the dragon demographics immigration and the future of civilization so the world is entering a new dispensation in terms of immigration those were the dry words of irish mainstream journalist mick clifford on a late night political talk show where a panel discussed national backlash against state-sponsored mass immigration in ireland he went on to say the government thus has a duty to condition the population to accept it which is quite a thing for a journalist to say he stressed that immigration is going to be an increasing reality and consequently we are going to have to change the way we live so i'll just open up the video for you and let's have a listen to it now this is fair use i don't know how long my channel is going to last anyway so but uh look it's uh the tonight show on a uh, virgin media it's just a short clip 
So have a look. Yeah, that's necessary, but I think what is even more important there mm -hmm. is medium to long term planning. The world is entering a new dispensation in terms of immigration. Immigration is going to be a reality. It's going to be an increasing reality, particularly in areas like climate change. Those of us in the West, we're going to have to get used to it. Otherwise, we're in for very serious issues if we don't. And to that extent, a government needs to plan long term. It needs to plan, for example, Catherine Day's group suggested there should be six reception centres. That should be under planning already. It should be planned in a way to ensure that there's social equity in how it is done. And also, we need to ha ha have a conditioning to <coughs> realise that we're going to have to change the way we live because there's going to be an awful lot of immigration from here on in. And it has to be... And the other thing is, we actually need immigrants in this country because of the demographics. But all of that, the government have, have a, a duty to plan long term for all of that that's coming. <laughs>Sorry, a bit of an awkward screen share there. So that's Mick Clifford. And it's it's sort of, um, I could imagine as as maybe you, maybe the same as me, you sort of, even as you're listening to that, I, uh, this is my feeling anyway, as I'm watching him, um, I sort of almost zone out. It's just, a, as I say here, a gray man in a gray suit. He, maybe it's a black suit, I don't know. But he's sort of, he's a, he's a complete regimist. He writes columns. He's quite intelligent, and to be fair. But he writes columns following various situations and he's effectively, you know, he takes what I can see as the regime line on absolutely everything. One of these types of journalist, right? And um, he uh, he's making this argument and it, I suppose I'll just read what I said um, because, like I say, it's a bit, it's it's kind of almost seems boring. It's some, some guy on the telly, but you have to actually like dissect what he was saying and just think about it. And now we're supposed, allegedly supposed to live in a liberal democracy, right? Supposedly, bearing in mind that 80%, 70%, whatever it is, the majority of people are against this mass immigration. So, as I said, I doubt the habitual viewer of this program quite grasped the magnitude. Just bear to keep in mind, like an average person at home, sort of with the remote in their hand, just kind of watching it. Some he's some he's some big shot guy, a journalist guy. He's smart. He understands politi politics. I'm just going to listen to him. You know, it's just like a normal average Joe Joe blogs kind of watching it. Yeah, uh, I doubt they quite grasped the magnitude of what this man was saying to them in their living rooms. Perhaps the effect of a grey man in a grey suit on television made it seem authoritative, reasonable, rational, inevitable, boring almost, but in fact what he was saying was objectively fringe, baseless and extreme. Um, objectively fringe, baseless and extreme. Uh, someone like him would go on the telly and say that I, as a streamer, a journalist, activist, I'm uh, I'm supposedly extreme, radical, fringe, far right, all this kind of stuff, and yet the majority of what I say, almost all of it, is sort of sits with the statistically with the majority of people. It's it's what people believe for the most part, and I think what I'm saying historically, um, in the long arc of history, and geographically, if you take into account China, India, all these other countries, my beliefs would be seen as so basic as to be uh, a waste of breath, to even say stating the obvious. And what he is saying, if you were to break it down for an average Indian living in India, say, this guy is coming on, tell, uh, on TV and telling us this. Imagine if there was an Indian pundit coming on telling you this same stuff, telling you that, um, that uh, let me go back over what he said exactly. So he stressed, uh, immigration is going to be an increasing reality, not that it's a democratic issue that we should have a say on. And consequently, we're going to have to change the way we live and that it was the media's uh, job to reprogram us to accept it. This is someone who claims to be a journalist in a liberal democracy telling us this insanity. So I'll just go on. I think the best thing is for me to just read from this. Um, the world is, of course, a large, varied place. There's a lot of different civilizations, countries out there do different things. This particular pundit wanted the audience to take for granted that rates of immigration necess necessitating massive migrant plantation centers to be opened in your local military barracks, schools and old folks homes at 3 a.m. under a police escort against the wishes of the in of entire communities and the nation as a whole is just the world being the world, a convenient alibi. So, yeah, again, this is what they do. It's it, whether it's uh, some, it's climate change. It's just the way the world is going. We're going to be seeing an increase in refugees in the next uh, coming decades. We're just going to have to accept it. Um, 
I never really grounding it in any kind of like moral, g- genuine, sound moral or legal premise, really, like anything that's fixed and, and coherent. It's always vague. In this case, he picks the most convenient alibi possible, the world. He's saying the world is like this. Um, and as I say, like I wrote this essay sort of chronologically as well, by the way. So the, the way I'm the way I've written this is how I came to start thinking about it. I saw this video of this man talking like this, and I went on a journey of a bit of research and I came, I ended up with China and talking about this. And um, because of course it sparks, as I say, back to the text, it got me thinking about immigration and the world. And so I began researching rates of immigration globally. Predictably enough, it turns out that some countries have high immigration, some low, some in the middle. What stood out most though, was one particular country which came dead last in immigration rates, perhaps an obscure micro nation that can hardly be deemed indicative of the world. So what I mean is Cuba, um, you, you can find a list of countries with low, very low immigration rates. Um, it varies, some of, you know, like I say, um, some high, some low, some in the middle. But, you know, you could pick a lot of small ones who, um, small obscure nations who have low immigration and someone could say, well, that's, you know, you're not talking about the, the, the general flow of where the world is going. And so that doesn't count. And so actually, no, to the contrary, one of the most pop- populous countries. I say one of the most. It used to be the most. It, India, I think, has overtaken China now. Um, a rapidly advanced nation, which is synonymous with the word future and indeed globalization. Again, talk to a normal person, ask them which country is sort of the future, which country is is the the caricature of what we would think of as the future of the world. Everybody knows it's China. That's um, Academics will tell you that, but Joe Soap on the street, China, yeah, they're developing, they're getting rich, the technology, all this stuff. Um, and the world's largest economy in certain measurements and all of this uh and as i say and indeed globalization so china is not seen as north korea it's not seen as maybe iran or you know sanctioned it's um it's synonymous with globalization it's almost one of the key spokes of globalization you know the factory of the world and all of this so by by almost definition they're doing constant trade with the whole world they are at the table of the un security council they are completely synonymous with globalization, no less than the likes of the US, Germany, UK, anyone else. So I am, of course, talking about China. Uh, it turns out that China's approach to immigration and diversity is not just a statistical tidbit, but is of great global geostrategic and civilizational significance, the magnitude of which I believe is underappreciated. As one report put it, and I'm going to open up this report and give you a look because it is very um, important. If you do, If you take nothing else away from what I'm talking about tonight, this report, which I'll open up, is um, is amazing, actually. And uh, I've lost the source, but I don't have it to hand here. But um, here's the paper. But there's a there's a Steve Saylor. He's a sort of a he has a website or a blogger. I'm not quite sure who he is, but a lot of people seem to like what he says. He had an essay re- uh, maybe a year or two ago, kind of talking about this. I haven't seen anyone else talk about this, but it's a massive paper, according to Steve Saylor. It was it cost like two hundred and fifty thousand. It was it was funded uh, for the research. It's basically a paper that's like uh, the length of a book. It was um, it was sub- uh, submitted to the Pentagon, effectively funded by the Pentagon, um, and it was only released in some strange litigation circumstances where the paper got. I, I effectively leaked through litigation. Basically, it was meant to be an internal, call it like a like a strategic planning document for the U S military effectively or state, um, understanding this sort of cold war two with China. And, uh, and, uh, we have the pleasure of being able to read it. It's excellent. Now I disagree with the conclusions again, just like with someone like Niall Ferguson, I think it's extremely intelligent, but I think it ends with the wrong conclusions because that's who's paying the bills is the Western American led regime via the Pentagon are paying for it. So I suppose they're not going to go too far off the reservation, whether it's because they believe it or not, or whether they're being paid to, I mean, what's the difference? Um, 
but uh, but the content of it before they reach the final conclusion and kind of say what they're supposed to say, the content of it it's very honest, it's very real, and it's called the strategic consequences of Chinese racism, a strategic asymmetry for the United States. So, um, excuse me, it's um it's not it's not linked in the description of the video, but it's in my essay is linked, and it's you can find it through that, or just Google it. It's um a lot of it is the details are censored out, so the author who the authors are and some of the details aren't there but the the content of the actual paper is there now it's so long that there's no way i could go through it but there probably are some um aspects of the abstract or or um the conclusions that i could kind of have a look at and i read I'd say i read most of this there's some fascinating history the history of effectively chinese racism right which is a loaded word in the West. Um, it means bad person or something like that. But this this paper is actually an intel intelligent enough to sort of be fairly um, scarce on the moralizing. It just it 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 usually refers to racism as just um, ethnocentrism, in group reference, national identity, um, aversion to outside too much outside influence or too many foreigners in your country all that kind of stuff so it's it's fairly like i said it's pretty grounded um uh so yeah there are there are kind of ugly like silly bits like here in chapter one that they, they it's kind of does a treatise on like xenophobia racism what they are they're caused by human evolution and um, actually this is a pretty good take it's caused by human evolution the behaviors are not unique to chinese however they are made worse by chinese history and culture so what he's effectively saying is that racism so-called is is not just something that exists naturally as it does in all people across the world it is a basic basic natural social function um in group reference and and a uh, little bit of wariness of the outsider and all that um that is natural across the world in all people but it's actually it's strong and it, it's in everybody's history and culture too of course look at Patrick pierce in ireland and all of this like um you know this kind of blood and soil stuff but in China, it's especially pronounced. It goes back all the way these thousands of years. It's um, the idea of the Middle Kingdom and the uh, sort of a form of chosen people, this kind of stuff. Um, and just like with Japan as well, of course, another East Asian uh, place, <laughs> uh, it um, it has a and and the the Koreas or Korea has a natural um, sort of wariness with the outsider like the the hermit kingdom and all of this stuff it is sort of um inherent to this east asian um uh, way i don't know for for whatever reason so uh, but as specifically strong in china and china is the big power so anyway uh, chapter two considers the chinese conception of race it finds that chinese religious cultural and historical conceptions of race reinforce chinese racism blah 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 chapter three evaluates nine strategic consequences of race chinese racism that's where it gets really interesting um i mean i could just fire through this i feel like it's worth dwelling on a bit um because effectively you know this says everything really it's just where it tails off on the wrong conclusion at the end to suit the the people paying for it i suppose is where it goes wrong but up until that point i kind of almost agree with everything in it um yeah um so yeah uh, u.s decision makers must recognize china that china is a racist state much closer to nazi germany see again they're making the parallels with nazi germany and the soviet union like they are really building up china as the the new enemy effectively and they, there's the new enemy based on its racism we'll say or anti-immigration sentiment um, which while they're doing that they're trying to crush that in the west i mean viciously trying to crush that all over the place so it's it's very strange it's almost like you know you had the communists the red scare in the west while they were on the foreign front the international front they were fighting the trying to contain communism all over the world and all of this and uh, buy off and pay all of these small states in africa and south america and so they were on a crusade effectively um, and yet they had their own domestic population that they were always suspicious of and trying to, uh, you know, for being communist. Um, in it, same here, they're they're trying to push back on this China race thing, um, and trying to talk China out of it and put them out of their, uh, talk them out of it and also like blacklist them on the international stage. 
while crushing internal dissent internal dissent which at this point is you know the vast majority of people which is so it makes it even more extreme and higher stakes than it was in the original cold war we'll say so second uh, racism informs their view of the united states for the chinese perspective the united states used to be a strong society that the chinese respected when it was unicultural defined by the centrality of anglo-protestant culture at the core of american national identity aligned with the political ideology of liberalism rule of law and free market capitalism the chinese see multiculturalism as a sickness that has overtaken the united states and a component of u.s decline third Racism informs their view of international politics in three ways. First, states are stable and thus good for the Chinese to, to the degree that they are unicultural. So China actually has a preference, in a sense, for unicultural powers. They find it easier to deal with those uh, states because, like it says, they are more stable and coherent. Um, second, Chinese ethnocentrism. And bear in mind, this is just one subsection of one like subsection of a chapter. There's so much here, but um, I'm just doing a, a brief overview. Um, Chinese ethnocentrism and racism drive their outlook to the rest of the world. Their expectation is of a tribute system where barbarians know that the Chinese are superior. Third, there is a strong implicit racialist view of international politics that is alien and anathema to Western policymakers and analysts. The Chinese are comfortable using race to explain events and appealing to racist stereotypes to advance their interests. So effectively, they're realists. And um, you could say in like the John, Me not so much the John Mearsheimer sense, maybe that too, but they're they're just literally realists. They, they've they are viewing the world as they rise and as they advance and as they take a market share in the world and um, become more hegemonic, especially relative to the US. They are doing so on a basis that is 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 rooted in reality, as opposed to the American led regime, which includes Europe and Australia and everybody else, even Japan to a point, um, which is um, which is trying to sort of fight this Cold War or proceed on the world stage based on complete lies whether and that is to do with sex and gender that is to do with race ethnicity and nationalism uh on every front so uh, the chinese recognize that so again this stuff is all completely relevant i say us generally western dissident white people it's so relevant to us it could not be more relevant to us and uh, our understanding of it is, is crucial so uh fourth the Chinese will make appeals to third world states based on racial solidarity. That is the need of non-white people. So this is kind of the Maoist thing still in China, which is unfortunate and is a bit of a prickly issue. But um, yeah, they, so while they're basically like their their form of and the, this paper laments this fact and, you know, kind of moans, bitches and moans about it, is that, you know, because the West is so um, guilty about itself and has this sort of regime over it, they will exploit that effectively they will play up the idea that the west is and because of the west was supreme for like three four hundred years um and uh, colonial as the west is racist even though they're the most opposite to that ever um while themselves being obscenely what would in the west would be considered racist and nazi and all of this kind of stuff maybe that's a trigger word i shouldn't use but um yeah, so they're going to play both sides of it effectively, is what what the paper says. Uh, fifth, Chinese racism retards their relations with the third world. So they try. It, this paper tries to make the claim that it's going to like hinder them, that the third world will hold it against them. They won't. The bilateral trade deals and all of that um, work just fine. Africans actually don't really care, nor does anyone else. Um, I think this is. Yeah, I could go on and on with this. I mean, you. I think you just have to read the paper to be honest. So I might get back to the text, and I suppose I should check check the chat um yeah i hope this isn't uh you know kind of boring you like this is, to me this is like something i would i would like to teach uh i would love to teach university students to give a lecture on this and um god that would be good um get um because you know they're a captive audience they have to uh, listen to you but uh, also because um in a sort of a live setting with random people which is what you get in a university there would be you could there'd be such interesting discourse to be had on this among students um, but of course, we're not allowed to talk about it, which is a, kind of a problem. So I'll just go on. So um, as this report, this this uh, Pentagon report put it, to quote the last the Chinese are the last great the last major racist great power. Last they say the last right. So it's, there's been this long sort of march across the world, and this has been somehow inherent in the Western Anglo Zionist whatever American. Um, crusade of of the past few hundred years has been to sort of somehow bring this to an end the idea of a 
particularist way of life and state where it is based on a people it's based on a coherent idea um the the original concept of statehood that that is fundamentally bad and we all need to become totally diverse and this that and the other um and that chinese as they say are the last so it, there's a continuity to it in their view major um racist great power soon to be a superpower and so their beliefs and the strategic consequences of their beliefs are very significant to, to comprehend and like i said that echoes my view on it because i think the the consequences of all of this of all of this are very important to understand um and i i just think our guys are sort of leaving it on the table a bit some of the history and some of the current issues as well and the reality the current day reality in china so I go off then basically to look at the numbers in China, right? And here's where I got kind of stuck because the numbers are a bit tricky. You can't get necessarily reliable data. The Chinese state, for obvious reasons, doesn't just publish everything up front for the whole world to see. They keep a lot of it close to their chest. They do census, but um, they don't put everything out there. So they'll talk about foreigners in the country, um, but they won't exactly define what they're talking about. What like is it an ethnicity or or a in a, a national identity or a civic um like having a passport or a visa or whatever they don't quite um uh delineate that so basically i had to extrapolate it so i go off on a big ramble here basically about why how ethnicity works in china so the idea that like china is an ethno state basically it obviously is but that they will see a a Chinese girl who's third generation ethnic Chinese girl in America who speaks no Chinese has never been to China is like four generations deep in in America effectively has adopted an American identity and has no connection to China they will see that girl as still fundamentally Chinese she's ethnically Chinese and thus she will always be Chinese and similarly someone who's lived in China their whole life a rare occurrence a foreigner like an ethnic foreigner who lives in China their whole life will in china it's, it's just common the the common culture they will never be viewed as chinese they could ha they could have a level of chinese fluency that a chinese person doesn't have a uh, poetic ability knowledge of history ability to write in ancient forms of uh, uh chinese and know all about confucianism and all this and they would still be viewed as a foreigner no matter what right um because they are ethnically foreign and then it's just complicated there's there are complications basically where it's like that may be true but then on the other hand there are 55 i'll just read my bit on it uh, there are 55 officially recognized ethnic minorities in chinese borders including tibetans mongols manchus making up 10 almost 10 percent of the population most of these people live in their own distinct regions which were um historically absorbed by han china to consolidate frontiers and address national defense concerns they're effectively separate territory territories of their own yeah i need to go on but basically it's it's that they're seen sort of as um they're Chinese in a sense of the greater Chinese state. They're confined to their own areas because of uh, the hukou system. I'll pronounce all these words wrong, but um, basically within China, internal migration is itself regulated. So these places are sort of effectively different countries anyway. Like Tibet is way off to the West doing its own thing. Tibetans don't just come back and forth to um, Shanghai as they as they want to. They, they can't basically. So you know, like I say, in effect, those are different countries. They're within the greater Chinese state. There's a historical context for that. But even though China has 10% minorities, technically they don't really. In China proper, we could say, which is the eastern and southern side of the country, it's almost entirely Han ethno state. And um, you're not going to be walking around, like I say, uh, any of the major Chinese cities and finding a whole lot of uh, these ethnic minorities china is an ethno state and that's a that's not really an exception to it it's just a sort of a wrinkle um tangential to it so um, and this is like i said here this is where it gets complicated then because foreigners effectively like a, a, a for foreignness is exclusively an ethnic thing in china and yet when they count it in the census it seems as though they they count ethnically chinese people who come back so someone who might really be chinese they went to america got a passport and then eventually they renounced it and came back to china and you know rejoined china as a citizen properly they would kind of be counted as an immigrant so it complicates things that you're looking at the small amount of immigrants that they take and yet every indication seems to be that a large majority or a, a significant proportion we can't we can't tell how much but it seems that a lot of that is just chinese people if you're taking the ethnic definition anyway so it's kind of like it's sort of um it's contradictory 
Um, but I have loads of sources. If you want to go through the article, and it's, it's in the bottom, there's there's like a little um, hyperlink as well. I've given this whole, yeah, diaspora, someone says in the chat. Thank you. That's the word I was looking for. So basically returning diaspora are just counted as immigrants, even though they're obviously not e even by their own definition. Um, and so I won't like bore you any more than I might be already with the the um, the smaller details about that. But I, I, effectively, I, I wanted to use a number. I didn't want to just accept it. That's what most authors on this Chinese immigration issue did, is they just kind of wash their hands and say, we don't quite know. Um, but I wanted to just say, no, no, let's take all the the data we do have and let's like settle on conservative estimates of based on clues that are around the place. Again, this is all detailed in the essay. Let's take those clues because we can make a reasonably informed decision. And once we err on the side of being conservative, let's say, and then actually get a number to use well it's not an exact science that number but it's a useful number um for us to be able to think about it instead of just sort of washing our hands of it and not having a number to kind of think of it by and again like i say i've i've been conservative with all these estimates um and you end up with then this is the key here are the numbers this is mind-blowing and this all started with me watching mick clifford talking about how it's inevitable that we must have 10 million billion immigrants in ireland for some magic uh, uh, reason that he doesn't quite describe. So, so what I concluded that, and uh, and like I said here as well, is that while it's a bit of a back at the back of the envelope job, um, and some of the data the Chinese put out there itself, maybe maybe they're fudging it or whatever. The point is, is that even if the numbers were over over or under uh, by like an order of magnitude, the the contrasts are so stark between what they do and what the West does. That it wouldn't really matter anyway like you could basically multiply any of these numbers by 10 or divide them by 10 and it it's so stark that it doesn't make that much of a difference or it doesn't affect the salience of what i'm saying but um with that said what i came up with my closest guess based on what we have is that uh, as of maybe the last couple of years non-ethnic non-ethnically chinese foreigners in china who have been there for over three months. So they're not just someone who flew in for a brief business visit or something. They're there for over three months. They're not permanent by any means, but they're there for a little while at least. It uh, would be 422,000 non-ethnically Chinese holding, holding a green card, which is, you can look that up and just Google it if you want to. It's uh, it, it sort of um, gives you slightly more rights. You can make your way around in China with the digital kind of system that they have. You sort of can like order stuff on, we chat and do your thing and and you're not going to be hunted by the police too much and all of that yeah so it's kind of like a i suppose you could say a temporary visa very to varying lengths you can just look that up but the people non-ethnically chinese who have those would be about three thousand, and non-ethnically ethnically chinese who are naturalized which is again I'd, it's complicated and the data it's very hard to find exact definitions of what they mean because it always changes and that's the great thing about the chinese state from their point of view is that their state just seems to make stuff up sort of they they tend to like just follow a common sense approach and the law sort of works for them effectively as opposed to here where no common sense is followed and the law is always used as a justification against the national population and against the state in a way and the functioning of the state you always have these immigration lawyers and ngos and human rights organizations and all of this where the law is always bended and twisted to allowing unlimited foreigners in so you have a dublin regulation but suddenly that doesn't matter because we've inserted a subsection here and we're interpreting it this way so now that doesn't matter and you know so it's almost like the law is just kind of they make it up as they go along in that direction in the west in ireland but in china they do it the opposite way they have a law it's coherent enough but at the same time over the course of a year or as it suits them they could just adjust it or start enforcing it differently and and they also don't go around telling the whole world exactly what they're doing and why and how so like i say naturalized the idea that you're naturalized in china thus you are a citizen you can never be deported you can never be kicked out because you're apparently naturalized and you're sort of a citizen it's vague the definition they don't really have a concept of even citizenship per se like the west does which is actually fascinating they don't really do that in their mind the idea of race is so strong as as a as a coincident with uh national identity that citizenship is almost kind of like an abstract it's a so, sort of like a silly western concept i think from a western or from a chinese point of view so anyway but insofar as they are sort of naturalized and sort of citizens there's 1600 and something of those 
And again, it could be 1600, it could be 800, it could be 5000, doesn't really make a difference. I think those are the closest to the correct numbers. And as I wrote, if these numbers aren't blowing your mind yet, then remember that China has a population of 1.4 billion. And to put that in perspective, let's compare it to my country, Ireland. If these numbers were broken down proportionally to an Irish scale, it would equate to 1,510 non-Irish foreigners residing in the country for over three months. These aren't permanent citizens or anything. These are just people who are here slightly longer than a holiday. They're here for a while, but they, they have no rights, like, you know, major rights to access um, social programs. They have no, there was no idea that just because you've been here three months, you can weasel your way in to stay here in a hundred different ways or that you, you know, you are completely a foreigner here at the leisure of the state temporarily. Those people um, are 1500 in all of Ireland. If you broke that down by county, what is that divided by 32? You're talking about a number of people you would almost never in your life meet, a complete rarity to see a foreigner at that scale, obviously in Ireland. Um, of those, how many with conditional rights to remain in the country in the medium term for five to 10 years, which would be the equivalent of a green card in China? Um, that would be 11. 11 people with basically medium. And again, they're not citizens. They don't have any, they could be kicked out at, at any time. That can be revoked. Um, and they could just be thrown out for any reason or none, as far as I can see. That would, uh, but uh, so 11, 11 of those. And those naturalized with, so-called like i say permanent citizenship it would be six six in all of ireland um six people in all of ireland how do you even think about that how do you even conceptualize that six people could live in a flat in a what they could live in a three-bed flat in bunk beds they uh, take an average rental house a semi-d whatever they could live in that and that's your whole country of people who have permanent citizenship and at that they don't really anyway because we don't have the same definition so um additionally china has only 583 non-chinese refugees on it book on its books they have more billionaires in their country um in irish terms that would be and like i said here that would be two refugees in ireland so the amount of refugees they have um on their books and again that's complicated as well because there's actually they took in a lot of vietnamese vietnamese refugees decades ago so i might talk about that separately but um yeah ireland took in two two so-called asylum seekers in 2022 alone and then i caveat myself oh wait no it was two on average every 12 minutes if you count the asylum seekers in 2022 and break it down by hours in the day and minutes there were two every 12 minutes one every six minutes in ireland and those are the ones we have on paper probably more um so then and this is the crux if you if you ever want to put something out about what i'm saying here it's that even if you go to the 2020 census figure on the amount of foreigners in China, um, this is the one that includes diaspora Chinese probably, um, it's 845,000. Whereas in the Irish census, the census of 2022, 23% of people identified as something as other than white Irish. So if you take the Chinese definition of what race and national identity are, we have more foreigners in Ireland than China has in China by actually a significant margin. margin. Um, if you discount the Chinese foreigners, so uh, like I say, it's 845,000, but if you discount the Chinese ethnic people in probably included in that, it would the number would be maybe half that size. Um, in which case, so if you take 845 and divide it down, so you get like 400,000 versus our 1.2 million, under those, by that definition, which I think is fair, reasonable and conservative, Ireland probably hosts somewhere in the region of three times as many non-Indigenous people. And that's not per capita, that's full stop. So this is despite being 280 times smaller in terms of overall population. China, or sorry, the Republic of Ireland anyway, has about 5 million people. So in our small little country, we have three times as many foreigners as China in an absolute sense, which is 280 times bigger Meanwhile, we're being lectured by Mick Clifford that this is how the world is. And like I say, I've 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 caveated that China is is not obscure. It's not to the side. It's not locked away from the world. It's it's a globalized economy. It's integrated into all the international systems, signed up to a lot or a great deal of the same, you know, human rights conventions and all of that, that 
Ireland is, not only are they signed up to those UN conventions, but they are a member of the UN Security Council. So again, by no definition can they be, they're almost the poster boy of, of a country that, if you were to pick one country that defines the world in any by any measure, it would sort of have to be China. Um, and yet we have three times as many foreigners, which all of those came into Ireland in like the last 20 just over 20 years, which is radical, extremely radical. And like I said at the start, this goes back to my introduction, which is that Mick Clifford was trying to come across as some sort of moderate, boring guy on the telly telling you something. But what he's saying is completely extreme and completely out of step with any rational interpretation of the world and what anybody wants, let's say, in Ireland. Um, so uh, China has naturalized an estimated six... 1,600 plus uh, non-Chinese foreigners as citizens. Meanwhile, according to one data analyst company, and this is the only fact in this essay that I have a source for it. The source is a bona fide enough publication, but I'd need it's the only one I would be willing to say it seems a bit high and I would need to see more sources. It's the only doubt I had when I wrote this essay, but regardless, I'll go with it for now. Everything else is fairly bulletproof. And this isn't just pulled out of a hat either, but I'm just caveating that. Um, so 1,600 non-Chinese foreigners, but according to one data analyst company, allegedly, uh, 150,000 Chinese went to the US to birth babies in 2018 alone. Um, now, I was trying to figure out the proportions there, and it, it is possible that that could be true because it is a massive phenomenon. that they It's not that 150,000 Chinese people go to the US to have babies to set, set up shop and become citizens there. I mean, some do, obviously, but a lot of them... Actually, it's not quite that. It's just that they fly over, they have the baby there, and then because they have birthright citizenship in the US, they have the passport now permanently. And it's sort of like, well, kind of why wouldn't you? Like if you've if you're a rich enough Chinese person to be able to afford flights um and you're due a baby soon, um, go over there for a month, stay stay in Chinatown, stay in a flat somewhere, you know, uh, hang out for a while and have the baby, and then you have your citizenship. Go back. You may never use it, but you've got this this piece of paper. It's it's the most preposterous situation in the world. It's completely extreme and crazy. I don't necessarily blame the Chinese people doing that. They're just rational actors in a sense. But that the US allows that is insane. Um, but again, here we are. Um, from 2004 to 2016, China issued 11,000 or so 10-year resident permanent or uh, residence permits. During that period, America, with a quarter of China's population, issued nearly 12 million green cards even with the numbers laid bare, the sheer asymmetry is hard to fathom. Now, I mean, just think about that. So 11,000 versus 12 million. And yes, the 12 million is the smaller country, uh, lunacy. Um, so I do feel like checking in on you all in the chat. Uh, but uh, yeah, we'll be back to current events tomorrow. I know you kind of attend probably most of you in the chat and that kind of it's the latest stuff going on on Twitter and uh, we'll get to that uh, maybe tomorrow night. But uh, so I might as well finish up this uh, this subject here. So uh, according to the Migration Policy Institute, the Chinese government's stated goal for their immigration policy is to promote economic development and national security while maintaining social stability. These goals have led China to discourage migrants who are not of Chinese eth ethnic origin. And again, I'm not making this stuff up. This is all sourced in completely mainstream publications. None of this is... Like I have my opinions come in here a bit, but uh, this is this is all just um, completely um, mainstream information. Uh, so what they do basically to control immigration in China, because that's the other thing we're told is that we just can't control immigration. It's first off, it's a moral and a legal obligation, but also it's an, an inevitability. We don't have these sort of, um, even though we're an island, Ireland is an island. Um, and we have border checks and all of that and airports. So somehow it's seen that it, and it, this is especially, you hear this a lot in the United States because of the Southern border is that there's, it's somehow impossible and completely impractical. Like when Trump tried to build, build a wall, that is some sort of um, pie in the sky idea. You just can't control it. The millions of people are going to come in and any populist demagogue who says that they can control it. It's not just that they're being, it's um they're being demagogues and they're they're sort of being silly but it's that or it's not just that those demagogues are wrong morally or politically it's that what they're telling you is something that is completely undoable so it's just uh you have a pied piper talking to you we the real 
regimists are being realistic about this that immigration can't actually be controlled of course it can be controlled um and it, for china they they have rigorous checks at the entry points of can you imagine going to china right the idea that you just walk in there is preposterous whether it's from tibet a boat coming up on the shore whatever it's not happening um uh, they make immigrants reapply for their visa at frequent intervals under very selective and opaque criteria. If you look up um, Luai and uh, Serpent ZA on on YouTube, they're these Chin Chinese, like American and South African guys who lived in China for a while. And they're very critical. They're very, um, I don't know. It's, it's uh, suspicious what they, who they maybe work for, but. Um, a lot of Chinese Chinese nationalists would accuse them of working for the CIA. I don't know, but um, or being CIA aligned or American regime aligned. But um, they've done lots of videos on it over the years. How basically they were living there, um, like these Western expats teaching English, living the high life. A lot of these expats, there's a word they use in China. They call them sexpats, and these sort of like white um European and American people who go to China and sort of. Like they would be low on the totem pole in the West, but they go over there and they they sort of you know lord themselves around the place. And uh, I think the Chinese culture got a bit resentful of them over the years. And eventually, the state started icing them out. So they were having a great time. You know, the currency exchange worked for them. Happy days. They lived there for some of them lived there for a decade and think they're gonna. They always have these notions. These um, expats in China about the idea that they're going to enlighten China which is very authoritarian and very backward and very silly. And they're, they're slaves to their totalitarian regime. They're not like enlightened Westerners and uh, the Westerner is going to go evangelize to them and sort of take it upon themselves to be critical of the state on behalf of Chinese people who just haven't got it going on in some way. That's the kind of attitude. It's very, um, I'm not, anti, obviously I'm not anti-Western, but that is this weird liberal attitude that Westerners seem to pick up in places like that. <clears throat> and people like uh, Luai and Serpent Zede made lots of videos over the years. This is well documented that between perhaps, I think it's after about 2017, 18, 19, 20, up toward COVID. It, it wasn't COVID that did it. It was started already. Was that um, the, the Chinese state started to ice them out. They would start to get random police raids. They would start to get asked for their papers and then told their papers are invalid and they need to reapply. But in order to reapply, they have to go get some other thing. And that thing doesn't really exist and this and that and the other. And next thing they're cut off from being able to use this service. And it's just a way of sort of politely icing people out effectively, just um, without like rounding people up in cages or anything dramatic like that. They're just kind of um, turning off the switch a little bit for these people and just icing them out. And most of them, you can see it, these Western bloggers and that in the in China over the years, sort of made long long strings of videos where they say oh it's getting harder here um and eventually they kind of they have a video like oh i'm leaving guys i've had enough and they effed off basically and that was that and that's westerners who were pretty respect like they're not like um these aren't like the immigrants we're used to like you know um but even the westerners and they iced out um guangzhou i think in china was known for a while as chocolate city it had a large diet population of africans because china does a lot of sort of has a lot of trade relationships with africa so they would take chinese students merchants and um, whatever into china and they seem to centralize them in a certain area of guangzhou um and there's a lot of documentation of how that a uh, chocolate city so-called is now if you go down to that part of town there's just barely any africans there at all that's gone too um and again there wasn't much of a much noise about it they just did it um so the other thing they do is many online and other services such as booking train tickets can require appropriate government identification making life di very difficult for illegal immigrants i would say probably impossible so this is the um what was it people used to talk about during COVID was the digital surveillance state or whatever, the idea that you need a card, a digital ID for everything. They do have that and they utilize it to, I've no, I don't, I'm not a fond of that idea necessarily, but they use it basically. And um, part of the use of that is to just, you can just turn switch migrants off if you want to. I mean, if somehow migrants were hiding in China, which I don't think they are, um, yeah, they just couldn't exist. They would, they would just self eject if before it, if they're getting taken out with so it's moot um the other thing is tasking employers landlords and the general general public who are as 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 the pentagon report detailed 
and as is well known, they are so-called racist. They are ethnocentric. They're against foreigners, or they don't want foreigners lurking around the country and all of that. Um, sort of hostile and uh, wary of foreigners. So you have a population that are naturally that way, and the government effectively uh, outsources it too, so that they, you know, um, this is a, I, I don't know where I got this quote from, but it's a direct quote from a paper tasking employers, landlords, and the general public with monitoring the immigration status of foreigners via, via rewards and punishment, i.e. carrot and stick, represents a de facto decentralization of immigration law enforcement. Think of everyone, most people in Ireland are against immigration, sick of it. And yet you have the random Roma and all these different people wandering around and all of that. Uh, you know, I'm not, letting, let's say, advocating for anything myself, but say the state were to make it a rewardable thing to say well if you know if, if someone's living near you and you wonder who are those people and they seem very strange and alien and they don't look like they're up to much and i don't know what they're doing if it was if it was a thing that you could just say like let's be real you're allowed to uh rat someone out for a planning that you don't like they're putting up they're trying to build an extension you can go in and say i don't want that and or like we see with people building cabins in their gardens or if someone's on the dole and you don't think they should be and they're working on the side you're you know it's, it's seen as normal that whether it's moral or not, that you're allowed to report. If it was somewhat that way with immigration too, you could just say, I'm not sure about those guys. Is someone going to check? And then immigration department followed up and said, yeah, you're dead right. Thanks very much for your service. Um, then you would uh, you would have a lot of that going on. So, and that would be carrot and then stick as well, of course. If you were some, <clears throat> there was a video recently came out from Bluebell, a guy who in Dublin, uh, for those who don't know, a guy who was, he had um he had a wood like he was selling these wood sheds these like sheds you put in your back garden with bedrooms in them or whatever like uh showmers and uh he had a, a yard full of those for like show a showroom effectively of those and stuffed full of georgians and uh what seemed to be illegal migrants you know people put a video of this up online now that was probably state funded anyway the uh the the migrants staying there but you know in 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 chinese society if you were to come forward with a video and bust some local chinese gone bean who was cashing in on these underground migrants you know you would um you would be given a reward and an uh, awarded for it and the guy who did it in it, i i bet in ireland he's probably fine now that he's been exposed he will have no consequence from that um in china he would be thrown in jail for probably a very 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 long time so the gone beans are given the stick right so to speak um and then uh finally immigrants who overstay their visa are heavily fined and or imprisoned before being ejected from the country so like yeah if you basically fuck around and find out like uh, across the board <coughs> it's very easy it's very obvious how you would how you would police this it's it's completely ridiculous to say that it can't be done so beyond practical measures china uses racism which is part of their national identity china has a long history of racism and it remains a key component of how they see the world, the central place in it, and the world's other inhabitants. Today, it acts as an organic national defense mechanism in tandem with state policy. And um, yeah, this kind of ethnocentrism, call it what you want, is a sort of a way of a people um, without having to rely on sort of systems to just sort of main, make sure that they don't get overwhelmed by foreigners and uh, displaced in their own country and all of that. A natural sense of in-group preference and out-group wariness. Um, that's just been the way of the world forever it's uh, it's kind of redundant someone like me having to say that you know but but in china it's totally obvious um chinese media like uh, this is just my words chinese media is a wash with commentary that would make the average western racist blush while um officials boast of a single chinese bloodline dating back thousands of years in 2017 xi jinping china's supreme leader told donald trump then america's president we are the original people black hair yellow skin inherited onwards we call ourselves descendants of the dragon um so you know that's kind of china i I've, i might as well just go on so um here i talk about the pentagon report um and how it's worth a look um i effectively summarize what it said it goes on to detail the strategic consequences of chinese racism for power competition between china and america and offer prescription on prescriptions on how the u.s should accordingly act the author admits as lamentable as it is chinese racism helps to make china chi uh, the chinese a formidable adversary there are three cr critical consequences that result from this the first is a sense of nation of unity the chinese possess second it allows the chinese to have a strong sense of identity which in turn permits them to weather adversity and to be focused and secure 
um, in confidence that the rest of the nation is with them. Third China is not plagued by self-doubt or guilt about its past, so they don't have this kind of um, Holocaustianity. They don't have this thing about slavery or colonialism, any of that kind of stuff going on. They're not plagued by any of that. And this paper admits it. So what's strange to me is that the U.S. state is sort of aware of this. Like they are, they are aware of what's going on. And the question is why they don't just model themselves on what China is doing, just fight fire with fire, let's say. But they seem, and this is where it gets interesting, is that they seem to be convinced that their way is going to work or some something uh, completely nuts. And uh, like I say, if you go to the dissident right, the discourse on this there is not there. We don't have, we don't have that much discourse on the US China Cold War II sort of thing. And yet, if you go to Niall Ferguson or the Hoover Institute or CSIS, they're talking away about this. They're talking away about these details, and they're just coming to the wrong conclusion at the end. Um, about how oh no, but it'll still be fine because ultimately freedom and diversity is more powerful because somehow you're right um so and this is where i get into that many western analysts somehow say or many western analysts however say chinese racism could play a significant role in its undoing the basic argument is that china has sub-replacement fertility and without mass immigration the population will decline rapidly throughout the 21st century becoming too top heavy with uh elderly dependent on too small of a productive demographic of a productive demographic creating a disgruntled domestic population a weaker economy and a less powerful china internationally um this is something that happened in the last couple of years where china's um demographics effectively have gone into decline and they believe that that is going to be the undoing of china and that is also one of the justifications of mass immigration in the west these are all central tenets of our our whole struggle here in the west they tell us that if we don't take in millions of migrants over the course of just a few decades with no limit, no common sense to it, that um, whether we like it or not, not doing that will lead to a complete collapse of our society. Basically, our econ economies will collapse. Somehow we'll become poor, go backwards technologically. I don't know what qu quite they're saying. They never quite... They never quite... Ex they say the economy, the GDP will collapse or something, but they never, they never really go into detail of like, the counterfactual of like say we don't take them in and we just go ahead and the demographics do shrink and we let's say hypothetically just we accept that there are downsides to that and there are challenges to that demographically health care and all of this stuff the economic pyramid being unbalanced and all that say we accept that and we just run with it um and we just cross those bridges when we get to them what would that look like how bad would it be they never really get into that um because that would that would necessitate exploring that avenue thinking about yeah well what would we do actually would we mechanize china is the leading in the world now in 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 terms of growth uh, in absolute terms of the amount of uh, robots and machinery and ai and all of the stuff that it's introducing so even as its demographics decline uh, they are they are mechanizing, and so is the U.S. and so is Germany and and Japan and and UK and everywhere is to some extent. The difference is that um, they are replacing their demographic shortfall with mechanization. Natural has always occurred, division of labor or whatever you want to call it, since the cotton gin and the steam engine and all of that, and um, reducing the need for people to do a job and increasing the value created on that product. Um they're they're going through that process so as their demographics decline the rate at which technology can take over is happens to be increasing rapidly just because of the way technology is progressing so it seems like a sort of almost like a pretty good match uh more or less probably one to one thereabouts so it's like yeah okay the 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 demographic pyramid will start to shrink from the top down um and uh, it'll be made up for by robots and a change in culture, a change in economy, a change in, I've always believed the social uh, system would change. The idea that families would become more, like intergenerational families would become more interdependent as they once were. And you wouldn't have to have too much policy for that. The country would just go a certain way and pressures would naturally create a sort of a, like a Darwinian situation where that's just inevitable that, that that's how people change their behavior effectively um and they just deal with it and that's fine um but of course the narrative as they're putting in the out to us in the west they're trying to sort of get into the chinese mind and the global mind to to say that china is screwed and they've been saying this for a long time as well 
they, they always have this about China. China's going to collapse one way or another. Its growth has slowed down. Now it's finished. So they had whatever it is, 10, crazy 10% growth for a while. And if the growth slows down slightly, they go, oh, here it is. China's about to fold in on itself. You see Peter Zihan talks about this a lot. Um, always another sort of scare story about China. Evergrande, the property bubble, this, that, and the other. It's always China is on the brink of some major collapse. But according to the Western official analyst, the West is never subject to those things. The instability created by um, ethnic and religious diversity, immigration, the, the 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 inherent instability of that. I mean, anyone can tell you that that is leading to some form of civil war breakdown. It, it's I'll get I suppose I get to this later on anyway, but it's a pyramid scheme anyway, like it's completely flawed and completely doomed to fail inevitably. And yet they never really look at that. They just say, no, that's that's not worthy of scrutiny. But China, whether it's Evergrande or a little dip, the dip in the demographics or or a dip in growth, it's somehow going to China is just going to sort of this ancient civilization and nation's civil national civilizational state because of like little piddling details like this is somehow just going to unravel somehow and and if you l listen to someone like peter zihan he again he doesn't exactly describe the house and the wise but he will tell you that china is going to completely disintegrate um and turn into some basket case a failed state is a term he'll probably use for that doesn't quite describe how and why just because of minor demographic ups and downs um so they're trying to put this idea out that China will miss out on the dynamism, ambition, and enrichment of immigrants, so the story goes. China's seemingly inevitable trajectory to world's largest economy will be stymied by their population decline, while the US, hitherto doomed to fail, fade, will maintain primacy due to mass immigration. So basically, mass immigration is the elixir of civilizational life in the West, and the absence of it in China is its, is, is its inevitable downfall. I suppose it's one of those things we'll just have to see what happens, but I know where I'm putting my money. Um, some estimates have the U.S. population ex exceeding that of China by 2100, which is hard to imagine. But they say that basically China will shrink. Its demographics are so sort of um, uh, have such sh shrinkage going on that by 2100, they'll have 541 million people, which would almost be a, like a threefold, like a third of their current population, just just um, over that. Um, and that... Uh, so yeah, no, that would be the U.S. population, and the Chinese population would be even lower, basically. So that like this, there'd be this radical switch, which would of course require hundreds of millions of immigrants. The American fertility rate, I'm pretty sure, is below replacement. At least the white founding population is. Um, so that's all immigrants from Haiti, from China, from everywhere, um, and they believe that that's um, going to possibly going to happen. But um, like I say, that's an extreme estimate, but the, the general idea that both populations could approach parity is not unrealistic. And the fact that Western regime intelligentsia are focusing on it is significant. This is all very relevant to us. Um, this is their big battle, and we are the internal opposition to that. We don't believe that. We actually believe, in effect, what China believes. Maybe at China, they have their own chauvinistic views about themselves, so we're not on their team, let's say, and they're not on ours. But the general factual view of the world, we share. And by we, I mean the majority of people in the West. And we're just ruled over by this tyrannical um, clown dictatorship. So interesting stuff. So one would be tempted. Uh, so I go off on a big ramble here then in my essay, basically, about the idea that on top of this narrative um, about immigration, diversity and nationalism, they layer on this um, concept just to kind of sweeten it up a little bit. The idea that, well, the big advantage of the West on top of all this is liberalism, whereas in China they're author authoritarian, and here we're democratic, and there it's a dictatorship with Xi Jinping. Um, but any serious person, being honest, will recognize this framework is merely Western propaganda. I mean, it is. It's, uh, I'll just read on what I said originally. Both China and the West have the capacity to vacillate between these poles, depending on the context. Activists critical of immigration diversity in World War II historiography, for example, in the West are routinely persecuted. I can't remember her name. Uh, Haverback, I think, this old lady who has been thrown in jail multiple times for denying a certain event around World War II or sort of questioning it or saying it wasn't what they say it is and stuff like that. It's just a view of history. It's just a woman from a country taking the old view from her country and all of that. And disputing a historical event she's been thrown in jail multiple times a an old woman 
again, if you want to talk about liberalism versus authoritarianism and stuff, I don't think they would do that in China. I really cannot imagine, and they're meant to be the big spooky bad guys, I cannot imagine a 90-odd-year-old Chinese woman, a venerable Chinese woman, um, who comes out and says, uh, she comes out and says, uh, Tiananmen Square was bad, the Chinese state oppressed us, Taiwan is, Taiwan is uh, not Chinese, and free Hong Kong and um, free Tibet. And it, it, she comes out with like, the, basically that's the, uh, the, the Chinese regime is allergic to those narratives. They don't like them. Um, if she came out and s said that, I don't think they'd be putting her in prison. I think they would just kind of marginalize her as much as they can, maybe ban her from social media. But if she, whatever she says beyond that, she just says, and it's just an old lady, like, come on, let's not be, Let's not be this draconian. It's insane. I really don't think they would do that. I cannot imagine it. And also, if you look up political prisoners in China, and some would say that, oh, it's because they suppress things. But even according to like CIA propaganda and stuff, you can't actually find a whole lot of political prisoners like documented anyway in China. Maybe it's because there's a chilling effect or whatever. But, you know, if you want to look at documented political prisoners, look at Sam Melia, who said... Uh, it's okay to be white uh, and stuff like that. He put some stickers up and he's in jail currently for I don't know how long he's going to be in jail. And he's got young kids at home. He comes across like a like a sweet as pie, nice guy. Um, and he's just an ordinary, what in any other country, what in Ghana or Bolivia or any country, you name it, would be considered such a mundane level of patriotism as to be a waste of your breath to even bother, you know, to say Ecuador for the Ecuadorians or uh, it's okay to be Asian or something like that. It's, it's, it's completely bonkers, you know, and, and the UK state will throw him in jail for ages for that. Um, on the most ridiculous, um, premise, just watch Mark Collett's video on that. If you want to learn more about Sam Elia. And plenty more. Rob Rundo in America, the the January six people who just were escorted by police into a building, a government building. Effectively, the police opened it up for them and said, "Hey, work away." And for a lot of the people there, a lot of people who were just walking around and thought they were just having a bit of fun, no big deal, or have been like had the book thrown at them by the state, thrown in the gulag, effectively. So this 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 liberalism, authoritarianism thing, um, I could go on and on about that is completely nuts and so uh, the reason i mentioned that is just because they they sort of temper the idea of like it's a it's a war of ideas about demographics and immigration and nationalism and race with china but it's also about us being sweethearts and then being some sort of boogeyman that's nuts right it doesn't make any sense if anything this is decent argument that uh the west is worse so um take for example in china a 2020 draft law that would have expanded permanent residency for high income migrants stirred up a torrent of criticism. So effectively Chinese nationalists um, online, you know, kicked and moaned about it. Uh, in an example of how public controversy around immigration can influence stability oriented Chinese policymakers. So they're just kind of common sense. Like they wanted to bring in migrants maybe because they had capitalists and industrialists wanted to bring in some cheap labor. The public complained and authorities responded swiftly by shelving the law. That's it, um, done. Um, meanwhile, the public, when polled in the West, usually say they, and I have links to stats and all this, the public polled in the West usually say they want less immigration, yet all they seem to get is more, no matter who they vote for. The Tories for the last 10, 15 years plus have been voted in ad nauseum on the premise of stopping immigration, not just lowering it a bit, but like really stopping immigration. And all they do is increase it more and more and more. Same goes for the Republicans, even Trump, all of these various, Georgia Maloney is the, maybe the worst example of all. They just, they, they run in a certain sense and then they just completely flip. Um, so I quote the Pentagon report here, which uh, they admit that, quote, if in contemporary Germany, a leading, and bear in mind Xi Jinping's words about black hair and yellow skin and, and inherited onwards descendants of the dragon. He said that publicly, you know, that's, totally commonplace in China to talk like that. Um, in contemporary Germany, if a leading intellectual were to identify people of that country according to their physical features, blonde hair and blue eyes, and represent them as descendants of a homogenous group, the Aryans, he would be expelled from the public sphere. In China, he is venerated. The, this is the equivalent would be venerated in China. Um, just think about that. Um, you know, 
I'll just quote what I said originally. Why in a supposedly liberal society where all varieties of sacrilege and obscenity? So tr drag queen story or which no one is in favor of, that's rightly seen by everybody as nuts, insanity, right? Probably 95% of people have polled would say that they don't want that. Um, and you can say, you know, piss Christ and all that, uh, that art thing, so-called. Um, you name it. There's the, just the most preposterous things are seen as um, are uh, not just, I said protected originally, but they're not just protected, they're exalted, right? The idea that if you are crassly offensive in 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 certain ways, that um that it's protected it's your right it's the it's the bedrock of our society and all of this then why if that's the case um would it be that making a basic observation about germany saying germans indigenous germans have this hair and they're descendants of this group and they are the real germans or something like that um why next to stuff like piss christ if, if being offensive is apparently fine then why would that not be allowed? Making what in any other society would be just a commonplace observation, a peaceful, reasonable observation. Um, surely it's just another point of view. No, it's because as a matter of unilaterally decided upon regime doctrine and authoritarian enforcement, there can be no indigenous people, there can be no natives, and thus no nation, no demos, barely a polity. Um, and that's the thing I've thought about for a long time, is the idea that they, they effectively don't want in the West there to be a polity. If you were going to have a country of 5 million people and they're saying, we're going to import 10 more million people, you have no say over it. Um, if you say that, well, even if you import those extra 10 million people, we are the original Irish. Like we are the real Irish, right? We're, we're, we have an ancestral claim going back thousands of years for the majority of people. Um, uh, you know, where the, they would say, no, 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 no. Not only are you, going to, are you going to take in these tens of millions of migrants, but you're going to be viciously persecuted by the state if you make a claim that even under that context, you still are a natural inheritor or member of that that nation state. That's banned. Um, in a situation like that, you sort of can't have, as I say, there, there, there can't be natives and thus there can't be a nation. And so there's no demos, you know, um, Dem, de, democracy and the Latin origin or whatever is sort of dem, I don't know, the, uh, Latin, but like the breakdown of the word is two parts, which is people and uh, I think it's power effectively, something along those lines. The idea that uh, people have power, but if you're going to say, I'll bring in 10 million people and I'm going to persecute you while I do it and exalt the other identity and it's going to have no end and you can't talk about it, you can't debate it and it's and it's inevitable then you have less of a democracy than China does, because at least in China, while they might not, they have their own form of electoral and government representation. It's not, I don't think it's as bad as people say. They do have sort of a, a public forum on these things. But even though they have like a single party state in reality and, a, and a, they have a, a strongman leader really in Xi Jinping, they effectively have more dem democracy even on paper than we do because at least though the system is not democratic, like they supposedly vote every four years on some made up two different parties who were the same thing anyway, they don't do that, but they kind of think, well, if if the polity is limited to us, then no matter what the form of leadership is or public participation, at least it's just among us. The polity is set and established and sort of concrete. And thus there's a power dynamic that exists between the ruling regime and between us the ruled that sort of exists in a natural place whereas we're told that we there is no you so if we say well we're the people i, I like i don't know if i'm over describing uh, over describing this but it's like the basic idea no matter what the form is of of the government governance or the the participation in political life and uh, public affairs regardless of how you do that system the basic underlying premise is that well, yeah, you're the ruling elite or the governor in some sense, and and then there's us. Whereas in the West, the ruling elite are saying, "Oh no, there's no you. There's us, and there's no you. And um, we are the state. We are the regime. We are the so-called liberal West. We are the we we are the we are the rulers. Um, but there is no you. So we rule you, but there is no you. You is everything. You is nothing. You are nothing. Right. Um." You are nothing. There is no you. I mean, I, and as I said here, um, I said, 
it's hard to think of anything more definitively anti-democratic than that. It is. I can't actually, even in a dystopian fantasy where you just come up, you just think, how would you imagine the most slavish and undemocratic and non-representative and not fair and not right and not, I think democratic is the word in the true sense, you can't think of anything more definitively anti-democratic than that. That's as bad as it gets, where the rulers say, there's no you. We rule you, so that's your only identity, is that you're ruled. That's it. And beyond that, there's nothing. And if you claim otherwise, you're going down. Um, so the fundamental dividing line between China and the US empire is not a question of wildly different economic models either. It's not even something as straightforward as a holy war a race war or a battle of civilizations because that would be the battle between the the west and islam or whatever the civilization battles of civilization sam hunting and um, i i claim that there is on one side and i might sound like a china like sycophant here i'm not i just admire i i wish we were doing what they're doing and it was the other way around that'd be great i'm not i admire china in certain ways but this is just reality um, there is on one side an ancient civilization comprised of the largest ethnic group in the history of the world, the Han Chinese. America, by comparison, hitherto the most economically and militarily powerful empire in history, aims to be completely post-national or even post-civilizational this century and is already halfway there. In that sense, it's not so much a battle of civilizations, but a battle for civilization itself. And this is where the rubber meets the road, I think, because you're not talking about a battle of civilizations you're talking about on one side i'm just repeating what i said originally you have a civilization civilization defined i could get a definition maybe but i mean let's just be sort of conversational here civilization probably has a lot of definitions but and people will dispute how how rome was defined as a civilization but it's effectively um a way of life a people a state a coherent group in some fashion it might have a bit of diversity in it some states have different ethnic groups lodged within it and all of that but there's even in that context there's a bit of stability to it just like there let's say there is in china historical like america could have been that way up until recently yes there was the african-american slave population brought over and eventually through the civil war and the civil rights movement integrated into the state as full fully fledged citizens and equals but it could have gone on that way forever where it's just like yeah that's just in 400 years america just has this legacy black population then it's got a majority white population and that's it and and they've found ways to get along sort of and that's it and it would uh, arrive at a sort of stasis eventually and uh, i think yeah it would be the melting pot would work in that sense eventually something like that could integrate with the right state power to manage it singapore does this singapore has a diverse population but again they don't take they have basically a no asylum seeker policy they take professionals and stuff like that temporarily but they're authoritarian they manage their situation and that's it they don't make it worse um so yeah like you have an anti-civilization which is you know crumbling infrastructure decaying social trust all of this in america we all know the story um whereas in china they're going the opposite direction a lot of people are saying that a lot of the problems china has had over the last few decades since mao and for various reasons because they were underdeveloped historically for a while that they had sort of some negative aspects you know stuff like spitting on the street and low because of the communism i think people didn't really respect communal housing and a lot of problems like that if someone went to china 20 years ago they would have come back chafing and glad to come home because china just wasn't in a sense civilized according to like what a westerner would view or, or expect um and there's a lot of reports coming from china at the moment that very recently it's just come a long way in in the sense of if you're in one of the cities um things are developing and i have a lot of, i have plenty of examples infrastructurally but even culturally that they 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 actually are consolidating and doubling down on the idea of civilization, becoming a civilization like in the way that we would have thought of 1980s, Sweden, before Sweden and all these countries got messed up, Norway or Sweden, just the epitome, people who had just found the recipe, gotten it perfect, and you didn't have to be Norwegian or Swedish to be sort of uh, admiring of it. You would just say, this is just objectively civilized. It's, 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 it's not just 
it's not just not uncivilized, it's uber civilized. And it, there's an inherent quality to that. You don't have to be Swedish or Norwegian. You can just respect that as anybody to say that everything arrives on time. Everything is neat. Japan is like this. Um, everything is neat. Uh, everything works. There's a great social safety net. Um, no crime, no this, no that. Politeness, the whole lot, right? Um, yeah, infrastructure working perfectly. And uh, and then on top of that, even sort of cultural ways of life that are being instilled back into people, because that ultimately comes from the top down. I think culture comes over the arc of history, but it also comes from, um, you know, from uh, the state sort of um, imbibing it in the population. That's happening in China um, and the opposite is happening in America. There's the meme about New York subways. So I'll just go on. Uh, columnist, Dali Daniel, columnist Daniel McCarthy wrote, Quote, in 2050, China will be grayer, but all men don't start revolutions and their dependence on the state is all the greater. America's wealthy whites will be old too and younger, poorer Americans taught to find nation, taught to find fault with the nation's past may well wonder why they should sweat to pay for the former majority's retirement or for the pledges to Europe or East Asia. Population matters, but continuity of character matters more. Without that, a nation ceases to be. Um, without a shared culture, national bonds, loyalty or tangible stake in an actual society you're left with a mercenary polity. Mercenaries, as Machiavelli pointed out, were too individualistic for their own personal gain and wealth and lacked discipline and union. So I don't want to just read myself back over, but like the point I make there is that the US state is, is doomed to fall apart anyway because all, these people don't share in the identity. They're not being integrated at any kind of rate that can can account for this to instill a, even a civic identity. So you're not going to, like, the U.S. is not going to be able to call on the examples I give here, are Rajit, Juan, Chiumbo, Braden, Ahmed, or even Chang, to fight in Taiwan. They're not going to be able to get them to fight in Ukraine or Eastern Europe. They're not going to be able to get them to die off the Persian Gulf um, or somehow trying to invade Iran. They're not going to get these people are not going to do that. Like they they do not care. There have been multiple videos like um, Vox Pops in Britain where they go up to minorities and just add anybody in the streets of London or whatever and say, would you fight for your country? And people look at them like he's got 10 heads. They're like, no, obviously not. Like what country? What are you even talking about? And that even applies to the native English people there. They adopt that same apathy as well, of course, you know, because they have no stake at all in the society. So they're not going to fight wars. They're not going to go above and beyond. And uh, as um, as the the Pentagon report noted, one of its points was that they're, they're not going to be able to weather adversity. So China might go through its demographic decline and um, there might be consequences to that. Things might tighten up the growth, the, the growth that every Chinese person got used to, this exorbitant growth and a constant raising of standards that might taper off in certain ways. The young might become a bit alienated. It might have to rejig its economic model with, like I said, the robotics and all of this. People made redundant, and so the state then would have to come up with a social, like a redistribution of wealth model to that works. And that might be tricky, and it, the state might not live up on that as well as it could. And all of this is would be a process where the whole society would have to change because of a, a I suppose, a declining demographics. Um. Uh, but of course they'll weather that there'll be there'll be little um tricky bits along the way but they can weather that because they're a chinese nation and they're sort of in it together basically and uh, they can weather those things but how on earth does the likes of an ireland 2040 or a, a us 2040 or even us now weather this adversity when when people get poorer when people get colder in their homes when housing becomes in unaffordable when like um when a recession comes, uh, some form of recession or depression is sort of inevitable in the West at this point. They can't stave off the decline. It's happening as we speak. Um, and while they're bringing in millions of foreigners, that that cannot hold together. It's it's um it makes no sense, and um there's no um there's no ability to weather adversity there. P once it gets bad enough, um what you have effectively are these minority communities so called well they are minorities they're not going to be happy but um of course the locals then turn to nationalism which they're doing in ireland for example in a strong way now um they're not going to irish people <laughs> middle class people i wrote a post about this recently that you know when their houses are being repossessed and the rav4 is being taken back and all of that people who uh, to, until now might stay quiet for the sake of political correctness when things get hard, they're not going to be happy. 
But what are they going to do with a country with millions of foreigners in it and this government that is completely off the reservation, has no sense of uh, connection to the, the the people it rules? It's a mess. It's it's doomed. And the least thing they could do under those circumstances, and this is what's important, is that that would be one thing, a, a complete mess internally, complete incoherence and instability internally. So how can such a anti-civilizational mess claim to have some grand historic century-long competition then with China to be some sort of competitive force? It, it's completely asymmetrical. It makes no sense. So um, so I go on then to, uh, regarding the demographic aging fertility crisis. And this is a bit of a revelation to me when I kind of found out about it, is that um, it's basically a lie top to bottom. Like it's it's an entire lie. I don't know if this paper will open for me. It's kind of a weird sort of PDF. It may or may not, but uh, it's not going to work. So I'll just get rid of that. So like, you know, um, you, you can probably open it up on your own computer or whatever you have to open the file and go through everything but um um it, the paper basically goes on to say quote that the proposed solution does not solve their alleged problem raises questions about the true motives behind such claims so they effectively in a sort of academic sense like statistical sense take the claim that demographics are declining and thus we need to bring in lots of immigrants and it and that it is a problem in the first place they, they sort of discover that, well, if you bring in lots and lots of immigrants, it doesn't really fix the problem because, of course, if the immigrants are going to pay for the pensions in, our, let's say, Ireland, who's going to pay for the immigrants' pensions? More immigrants or whatever. So so it's just a pyramid scheme that actually doesn't even solve itself as it goes, really, at all. Um, and we can see that, you know, like we, we haven't, this is the promise we've been given. And, of course, we don't see, like, who in Ireland could claim that Ireland is, like, tangibly, noticeably getting better in some way getting more sort of um, better infrastructure, better society, more economic wealth, like shared among the population. It's obviously that's not happening. So why would it, why would you expect it to happen? The same thing, different to happen doing the same thing again. Anyway, they go through it in a, in a very sort of rational sense. How, uh, yeah, like they say, and it's a good point that but their proposed solution does not solve the alleged problem that they're raising, which raises questions about the true motives behind such claims. Why are you saying it if we can all see that it won't actually solve what you're saying anyway? Um, and then I quoted an essay as well. There's another, it's an older essay. It's probably like 15 years old that the idea of demographic aging and low fertility and being a crisis, that it's not in itself a crisis. And if it were, which it isn't, an insane Ponzi scheme wouldn't solution that. So basically they're they're making up a problem that isn't necessarily what they say it is anyway. It's not the problem they make it out to be um, inherently. And the solution that they're suggesting for this rather non-existent problem wouldn't solve it anyway. So what are we talking about? What is this? Um, and you see it with Musk, you know, Elon Musk. It's a big thing on the right, this whole idea of like, we must solve the demographic. We must, uh, for, not force, but kind of uh, twist everybody's arm into having more babies. Because if we don't have over the magic number of two babies, somehow the the sun isn't going to rise in the morning um and society will turn into some sort of failed state again it's never explained exactly how that is uh the population has been in decline for 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 a long time it's a process that's just ongoing in the world i believe that it would be healthy it would be good for the environment it would be good for society would think of young people who then do want to have babies and um, there would be such a oversupply of housing stock that housing would be cheap there would be resources free, uh, like available, um, more available, just for obvious reasons, and uh, it might actually encourage an uptick in in reproduction. Then, it would just be a natural cycle. So, the whole concept, the basis of this concept that they're they're pushing on us that apparently we have this fertility crisis that is a problem and thus must be solved by this non solution. They're pushing that on us, but they're also trying to push it on China. That they're trying to say, look over there, look over there, China's doomed they have declining demographics and they're not doing immigration so it's just a matter it's a ticking time bomb before china falls apart um it's um that's their whole central claim they're like the whole central like the claim made during communism against that uh, or against the soviet union uh, stronger you could even say uh, against nazi germany and and czarist russia i don't know the, maybe those arguments sort of there's something to them the productivity of western capitalism and liberalism maybe made sense but I just think that whole argument, which there's continuity to it, 
is grinding to a halt. It, it's completely failing across the West. And um, and as I went on to say here, the proof is in the pudding. China currently la launches an equivalent of a Royal Navy every four years and in 30 years, so a Royal Navy every four years. So in terms of the military parity, look, it's inevitable. Um, and in 30 years, Shanghai went from having no metro system at all. This is a massive city. They went from having no metro system to having the largest, most sophisticated and affordable one in the world. I don't think that's just Chinese prop propaganda. You can see it in videos for yourself, sort of objective people who've seen it. I, I don't think it's really disputed. They really did in 30 years in a massive city go from having no metro to having not just a metro, but having the largest, most sophisticated and affordable at the same time in the world. Um, and this year, China became the world's largest exporter of cars. And as I said here, all with the indispensable help of virtually no immigration. So they just, they yeah, they brought their rural population into the cities. But you see these cities pop up out of nowhere in China. The subways, the best, most affordable subway system in the world, many of them, um, and intercity rail, everything. All of what China has done that we're all supposed to be marveling over in the last 20, 30 years, they did that with basically no immigration. Um, and yet we're meant to believe that it's impossible to have a functioning society if you don't bring in millions of people against the will of everybody. And as we watch the society become less uh, pleasant and uh, we don't get metros, we don't like we're meant to look at a road, an M50 or something that was built 20 years ago that would have been built under any political um, system, which is a thing I was talking about last week. The idea of like. The idea of like uh, if Archbishop McQuaid was taking credit for the rural ele electrification of Ireland, every country in the world, Western country anyway, advanced in rural ele electrification more or less at the same time. It came about the, the the science was sorted out in the late 18th century. And then over the course of about 50 years, it started to be rolled out into cities and then into the countryside everywhere. There was a natural, the technology existed, the bang for buck of putting it in was worth it. It was available and so it was just done everywhere and it's in i look there's a great documentary on it it's called um death of the banshee uh, it's very interesting but it's it wasn't uh liberalism or capitalism or communism or catholicism it wasn't anything in particular it just happened and the same goes for like these big eu signs on the motorways in ireland so they say oh well you didn't have motorways back in the old days of the 60s catholic illiberal ireland let's say or the 80s and now you do thus correlation equals causation it's because eu it's because of diversity it's because whatever and even at that there wasn't much anyway like we don't we have a couple of roads we have a port tunnel we have a few motorways and every few years another little portion gets added on which should be in the modern with modern technology you know machinery and everything i mean that's bare minimum like if you didn't have that you really would be full-on third world and um, even third world countries are putting up these motorways. I mean, it's just, it's it's beneath bare minimum. And yet they expect us to be wowed at the idea that we're, our, our social fabric is being torn apart. Our demographic, our, our national demographic, our, our, our nationhood is being destroyed by mass immigration and we're being oppressed as they do it. And we're meant to somehow think of anything that has happened at all, any kind of roadworks at all as... Um, as as the justification for it when it's a bare minimum we don't have you know if they can do that in shanghai they should be able to do it in the leinster region a metro system and all of that they don't they don't none of that happened it's more or less putting aside a, an m50 here a tunnel here one or two things here and there ireland is virtually infrastructurally the same as it was 20 30 years ago you know before that the motorways weren't there but again that's just like a, a technological advancement like motorways started in the us and germany with the autobahn and the interstate and then it kind of spread around to all the other countries equally that's that's not a special credit we've actually had nothing it's awful the lewis a tram system a tr a trams existed 100 years ago right um and in reality these things are kind of getting worse because even if you take the motorway which it is nothing the motorway which we have a big eu sign to tell us that it was diversity and western liberal whatever it is, is responsible for that effectively. That's what that sign is. Um, well, like if you drive up and down one of those motorways, you'll have to pay tolls twice. The roads are paid off. So, and you're already paying motor tax. So it's like, whereas in China, they got 
the best, most sophisticated um, and largest metro system in the world, and it's very affordable. So it's, 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 you know, like I was, I was, I don't know, is this Jefferson or whoever came up with this phrase, but it really does sound like in China, which is meant to be the authoritarian nightmare, that China in a general sense, if you look at most of it, it seems to be kind of, um, to quote that phrase, it's of the Chinese, by the Chinese, and for the Chinese. A very simple concept, apparently, that used to exist in West, it was a part of the Western canon to think that way. But that's gone now. Like I talked about the polity a while ago that we don't have a polity. It's, it's you know, whereas they have that basic concept still in action um, or not uh, thriving, um, obviously. Um, so I I know who I'm placing my bets on. So, um, and then I just quote some EU, like Western regimists. So you can't please everyone. President of the EU Chamber of Commerce in Beijing, Jorg Vutke, traveled through China 42 times. I, I, the article I'm quoting from is linked. Um, traveled through China 44 times on domestic flights in the pandemic year of 2020. The frequent flyer noticed that almost all passengers were Chinese. And to quote him, he said, only, and there are many quotes like this from different people, only once I walked by a foreigner at the airport. That was so unusual that I turned around to look at him. To Wutke, it felt like stepping back in time to the 1980s when China was opening up and foreigners were a rare sight. Back then, hope, hope resonated that foreigner policies would soon change. Hope among who? Why? Uh, to quote him again, they needed us for their reforms and they wanted us in China. Now, however, he senses the opposite trend. And to quote him again, worst of all, no one seems to mind that there are fewer foreigners. I mean, I could ramble or I could just say what I said originally. The last line perfectly encapsulates the demented mindset of Western so-called elites. Why should Chinese people in their own country mind that there are fewer, for fewer foreigners? It's never quite explained. We're meant to take it as a moral first principle that peacefully existing among like people is a sin. Quote, and this is to go back to the Pentagon report. This is what it, because it does a bit of moralizing to it, uh, in its conclusions. To quote it, it says, it needs to be thought of as a clash between right and wrong, racism and anti-racism, a racist state and an anti-racist one. Just as in the Cold War, the United States needs to be on the right side. Now, as far as I can see, uh, China is just not taking foreigners, but for the, for the most part, small exceptions here and there, and it's it goes back and forth a bit virtually they take no foreigners in um it is what it is uh, uh, like so basically they have their cheap affordable nice metro system they have a society that is always getting more civilized like the, on the street level it's reported that china is always getting better you know people politeness is being fostered and that is being fostered by the state their posters and encouragement and all this stuff so it's becoming more like the likes of a sweden or a norway or maybe a better example is japan it's becoming more japanified but on a bigger scale. It's becoming more pleasant. The infrastructure is getting better. Um, it, it, of course, it has its problems. Every place has different problems at any given time. But um, they have that going on and they walk around and everybody is Chinese and there aren't minorities there to be racisted to, right? They just don't take them in. It's what any state normally would do. That's their right nobody is harmed if i want to go to china you know basically you have to be some sort of like nuclear scientist scientist effectively like an espionage candidate or um some sort of like major big brain with technology to offer and they'll sort of give you a green card for a while one in a million type of thing i'm not that person uh and so if i decide in the morning you know what i'm kind of interested in china i think i'd like to go move to china and just kind of live in china for an indefinite period of time i think i'm going to pack my bag and i'm going to write to the embassy and go i'll be just told no sorry and so will africans and indians and everybody else i'll just be told no i won't even land on at the airport i won't even you know i'd be turned around at the airport I, I, they probably look at me like i'm thick for just arriving um Perhaps they might let me go on a holiday there. That's their prerogative. Um, and so I don't, if there's some sort of ethereal racism that exists in China, allegedly, in the streets of Shanghai, I'm not there to be bothered by it. If I was there, when foreigners do go there, they report it as being quite pleasant. You just do you go about your business, but you're not, you don't belong there. Like, you know, you're there for a while, perhaps at best, and that's it. And uh, no one is harmed in the making of this kind of documentary. It's like, I just don't get it. Um that uh, that them existing among themselves, basically not harming anyone, 
in the streets of Guangzhou or Beijing or Shanghai or anywhere else, that that is somehow spiritually racist. Like it's 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 bad and it's harming people. The the idea of active harm, that there's an active harm within that. I uh I don't get it. It's 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 a, it's it is a total form of insanity. This kind of Western thing. A lot of it stems from Zionists. Let's be real. That's a whole story. I'm on YouTube, but um. So, yeah, the policies of forced diversity and replacement immigration, however, are domestically very unpopular in the West and becoming increasingly so, and are causing major instability. They, revile, they are reviled internationally, along with other social agendas like transgenderism. Go to Africa, and they are so allergic to the idea of Westerners trying to spread like gay rights and feminism and all that. Um, they are completely allergic to it. They're much rather doing a deal for copper or for lithium or whatever it is with China bilateral trade deal happy days everybody's good china doesn't interfere in their affairs and that's it it's just ordinary international trade whereas in the west it comes with the whole package of liberal evangelism and all of that and they africa in a place i know africa and i'm sure it's the same in the likes of india and other places they're they're very keenly aware of and they have a, a complete disrespect of the west for that i don't think they're actually anti-white I, I think they kind of admire the west in its traditional form but um, this sort of stuff, it just makes um, the West into a complete, um, what's the word? I can't think of the word right now. Um, like, a, like unpopular, basically. So one of the hopes in Washington is that if China can be exposed to its international allies, this is in the Pentagon report, if they can be exposed to its international allies as racist, they will suffer diplomatic consequences, specifically in Africa. And this is in that Pentagon report. It basically writes this whole factual realist view of how the West is screwed because of what we're doing. And China, the so-called racist state, because of its so-called racism, has all of these advantages. And it's very realist throughout. And then I suppose because of who's paying for it or whatever, they have to come to the right conclusion. And because the facts are so stark, it's kind of like, well, how are they going to come to a positive conclusion for the West out of this? And the measly paltry, this um, massive a book effectively that's written, that they end up coming to, this is bad, they have to scrape the bottom of the barrel, is that they claim that because China is, can be portrayed as racist by the West and America a bastion of universalism um, that takes in minorities and stuff or, or immigrants, that Africa will start to see China as the big racist Nazi bad guy and the West as good um, or that the, the developing world will see, see both parties that way. Um, there's no basis for that in reality. There's no evidence of that. If China were going to be seen that way, based on how they are, they would have been seen that way already. They don't get seen that way. And um, you speak to people in Africa, they don't have the this Western idea of uh, that Ireland should take in a million Africans. Africans, they don't. You would have anything I say on a, the streets of of um, Kampala or Lusaka or Dar es Salaam or anywhere else. With the views that I talk about here regularly on YouTube and get persecuted by the state for would be seen again, like I say, seen as so obvious, like, why are you telling me this? Like, is this meant to be insightful? They'd say, of course you don't want loads of foreigners coming to your country, like too many. And that's, that's obvious, right? And nor do we in their, in their own respective countries. It's just totally ordinary. So you're not going to convince the, um, the developing world of this. It's just not going to happen. And that's meant to be the salve at the end of this Pentagon report that, China are totally in the driver's seat based on their attitude towards race and nationalism. Uh, but here's the caveat. Here's how we're going to win, though. Here's how it works for us. Not going to happen. Um, so, as I said, the reality, though, is that Africans don't really care. So long as the no-string bilateral trade deals and infrastructure assistance continues, everyone's happier minding their own business in their own countries. This is an, an inexorable reality the U.S. seems incapable of accepting. So it's basically a suicide mission. That the west is on from the top down um and this is where i'll just wrap up the conclusion as well i'm just going to read it out here because this is this is just my big sort of conclusion on the whole thing um 2023 is a world historical turning point in my opinion it has been known for centuries that china would rise and sure enough in decades it has risen I'll go back to the Pentagon report. Very interesting history. The best thing about it, read the history of China and about the West, the rise of the West, the decline of China, the opium wars, all that kind of stuff, the whole interplay between the West and, and China. Even um, people like um, 
can't think of his name, but famous British poets and and um, the, the likes of G.K. Chester and all these kind of various thinkers. Yeah, I think even Napoleon, there's a quote at least attributed to him that even in the 18th century, when like the West late 18th century and the turn of into the or from the sorry, the 19th century into the 20th century. Sorry, I got that wrong. I think I got that wrong earlier as well. From like the turn of the 20th century, when the West pre World War One was at its, at its kind of peak, or maybe even during Napoleonic times, or, the, or Britain at its peak, colonial peak, there were people talking about people because back then people were classically uh, educated in history that kind of looked at the 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 fundamentals of of demographics, the countries, the size, the scale, the history, the civilizational inheritance of, and they saw that, um, yeah, uh, and Nietzsche probably would be another one of these. That that China, the rise of China is inevitable. They couldn't have predicted like Maoism and all these different things, but and the opium wars were going on around that time. But they knew that like yeah, these things come and go. But like China is going to rise. Like and China was poor at the time, but they knew that China had. They effectively understood the IQ question and all of these things. They knew that China was a a population of I don't know what it was then, but the the then equivalent of a billion and a half people. Um, they knew that it was a massive population of high IQ people and. Uh, that there's an inevitability to that, that they are going to rise, you know, and the West has within it fundamental sort of flaws as well within this liberalism, perhaps. But China, either way, China is going to rise. And uh, th yeah, that's in that Pentagon report. It's very good. But um, so, yeah, and so they rose and, and now it's happening. So we are in the midst of a millennia scale of civilizational turnover and our politics about nationalism and immigration and all of that, we happen to be on the 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 cruel end of that the butt of that joke basically we're stuck within it um so now as the rapid growth phase tapers off which was the easy bit for china to do its rise and demographic strength the real test begins as to whether china will truly take the baton of civilization from the declining west during the century of humiliation several chinese thinkers suggested their misfortune was born out of the civilizational allergy to progress that they wanted stability they liked insularity and the progress, rapid progress, technological and political and cultural progress was uh, inherently unstable and um, and dangerous. That their allergy to that um, it kind of led to the progress of the West. Well, the West embraced it, uh, radical social, political and scientific progress. Well, they didn't. That might have been their sort of downfall in the sense that the British got to just walk in and shove opium into everybody and all of that. Right. They just got basically defeated at the barrel of a gun. And so they had to sort of do a bit of soul searching and figure out what it was. And some of the thinkers at that time came to that conclusion that perhaps there's something in us that was inevitable that we didn't take progress and they did, and they got the technology and everything and the West rose. Um, so perhaps they were onto something, but they couldn't account for the different landscape centuries later. It could be just the turn of history. So what, what I'm suggesting is basically that actually the original t Chinese uh, ethos in the long view might have been correct actually to you know take things a bit slower um it could be that european civilization burned too brightly too quickly and now china is taking the chance to maintain its traditional pragmatism learning from the west in economic and technological prowess but avoiding the capitalist pursuit of infinite growth and the fire sale of its civilizational inheritance via policies such as mass immigration we are where we are so Xi Jinping recently speaking in China said, China's economy is an ocean, not a puddle. Sometimes the ocean is calm, sometimes stormy. A change of weather can wipe out a puddle, but the ocean will still be the ocean. China is eternal. So what he's getting at there is, um, I suppose, is this idea that like the economic phase might taper off um, and that the demographics might dip and that has certain consequences and it, there, there might be certain amounts of superficial surface level, like the puddle, or, or the uh, sh uh, shallow depth um, instability in China in certain ways there will be in any society, but there's a deepness there um, in which is uh, I don't know if he meant this exactly, but it's it's obvious that that's contained within the Chinese nationhood and the stability of the Chinese civilization, the people that not doing immigration basically at the scale we're doing, um, whereas uh, the West is shallow in that sense. So the populate the world population, and this is where it becomes inevitable, even to the Nile Fergusons and the rest of them, with their University of Texas uh, sort of new doctrine of like, I don't know, you need to look into him, you can find out for yourself. But um, even according to them, the idea that we'll just take people in and beat China somehow uh, through our expanding vitality of immigration, and that they will shrink and become 
like a weak kind of a, a weakened former version of it or a weakened version of its former self. Um, even if you take that on face value, the world population, including Africa, the big booming African population, that tops out before the end of the 21st century, the century we're in now. That tops out and eventually the entire world, including Africa, goes into demographic recession. They they go below replacement and all of that. And they, they get the same phenomena that the West did and, and China. Um, I mean, what happens then? Like, um, I'll just go on. Once Africa tops out, that's it. Nowhere left to immigrate warm bodies from to prop up a socially catastrophic demographic pyramid scheme. What then will be left of civilization globally? Perhaps a few city states like Dubai, elite post-national enclaves enjoying rare civility and order held together with money and an iron fist, so propped up by oil, wealth or whatever. But the, the, those places like Dubai are downstream from China. They also have clean streets and they enforce basic rules and all of that. So does Singapore. El Salvador is doing it now. Um, so you'll have these small little city states, but those are kind of irrelevant in a sense. Like what matters is the big, the big dogs, the big players, the basically the West, formerly kind of white world, European-based civilization. You have India and all of that. I'll just go on. Um, so you'll have those small enclaves that just sort of enforce civilization art civilization artificially, sort of iron fist just through power. Um, these little ocean or little little islands of it. Um, I believe India has too many problems like social and ethnic stratification and lack of education that will impede its civilizational progress. So India is not India is a bit of a basket case now and has been for a long time. I don't think in the next century it's going to sort of become this highly civilized place on a mass scale. Um, and the West, if you agree with me on most things, everywhere you look is already in freefall. So just to conclude, as the smoke clears the century, China will stand alone, not because of its economic and scientific successes, but for its ability to achieve them without being poisoned in the process. As the rest of the civilized world becomes a diverse, looted, neo-feudal wasteland, China will be viewed ever more apparently as an ocean of social harmony, order and culture, the future of civilization itself. So that's it. It's it's a bitter pill to swallow. Um, you know, that's the long arc of history. Um but it is what it is. I think I think what I've given is sort of a realistic uh, appraisal of the situation based on the Pentagon report, based on history, based on what we're seeing in front of us. It's that there are people looking at it, the likes of Niall Ferguson, the likes of CSIS, the, the intelligentsia of the West are looking at it and they are sort of observing what I'm observing, but they're trying to claim that somehow the West is going to um sort of succeed on that on that basis and China's going to fail. And uh I think what I'm doing here is to sort of take the same information and just conclude the obvious, which is the opposite. That's not going to be the case. If you're looking at the world as it's going now, in basic civilizational terms, in that what will these places look like? Like if you're a space alien and you're thinking, where do I want to be in 50 years? So 2074, like if I want to just be somewhere and I'm not, I'm not biased by race or culture or competing state interests and all that. I just want to be in a place that's like Norway in the nineties or something like that. I just want to be in a place that's nice and works and is coherent. Um, homogeneity is a big part of that. You're going to be going to China and um, that's it. So, uh, if you're taking that as your definition of civilization, that's where civilization is at. And, uh, the funny thing is, too, is that, let's be real, in spite of what the the regimists tell us, is that if the simple thing the West would have to do, because we do have a massive um, legacy, the West does, like every country individually, Ireland and Sweden and like in different ways, you know. Germany, Western Russia, all of this, like we, you know, taken as a whole, it's got a great inheritance and all it would need, even though China had this inevitable rise as people have claimed for centuries, the West could have maintained a certain legitimacy as well if it just remained the West. If it just didn't decide to import like hundreds of millions across the West of of foreigners, basically, it it's kind of as simple as that because it might sound simplistic because it's like, well, what would you do about um, 
what would you do about IQ and about the question of um, dysgenics and what would you do about AI and what technology and all this stuff, competing militaries and whatever. That stuff would all just sort itself out. If the West just, it sounds simplistic because I'm a, like, a, like a, I'm against mass immigration as a, as a like policy. That's my thing. So it sounds simplistic to say that if you just did what I think, it would all be grand. But it is as simple as that. If the West just had a state, a reasonable state that just listened to its own people, it wouldn't even have to come up with the idea itself. Just listen to your own people and be reasonable, be more democratic and actually don't take in all these people and just leave it at that. Everything else, the chips will just fall where they may and they will land naturally and things will sort of sort themselves out and you will have this great civilization of China that's risen and becoming, it becomes like a like a parody of a utopia, you know, where everything's working great and it's lovely and all that and it's very Chinese and, you know, they have sort of, um, their like Confucian culture and the, oh, I don't want to call it like Rivendell, but like they have, they ha they've achieved this kind of, um, techno utopia in a sense that they have all these metro systems everything's working great and yet because they have that stability of peoplehood um eventually they could lower the work hours for people gradually that just happens naturally with technology don't be totally oppressive try and distribute things reasonably well in the state which is what china has been doing raising people up and improving the place and uh, yeah, so they would have their their dragon things and their lunar new year and the, all this kind of stuff. They would have their tradition, their their bonds, their that feeling on the street of a reasonably homogenous place, plus the technological advantages advantages that come. And similarly, the West could have that. It could have its national identity and all of that, and then just take the inevitable technological progress, and then the demographic decline, and just match those things together and sort of have things get better from one decade and century to the next and things could just get better the way they have been doing in China. You would have these two different civilizations. You would have the Arab world, the Chinese world, India would do whatever it's going to do, Africa would do whatever it's going to do and then you would have the West and the West would just make peace with all of these former colonial empires or, or subjects. Just move on. And, and and China could be dealt with, as is known about the literature of China. They are sort of rational about statehood. They want to deal with stable entities. And uh, it is what it is. Anyway, I um, I went on and on and on. You know, I just I, I kind of wanted to say my piece on this because I wrote it and I wanted to kind of get into it a bit more and justify why I'm interested in this. And I also want to make it so that people use this example like, I'm rambling a lot, but go to the statistics, go to the amount of foreigners. People will dispute the numbers because none of us know exactly what they are. But effectively, Ireland either has the same amount of foreigners. Sorry, Ireland, under any definition, has more foreigners than China. But under probably a realistic uh, definition, it probably has like three times as many. But that's, I mean, it's a distinction without much of a difference, really. That's a major fact. We're all signed up to a lot of the same international protocols. A state can just decide to interpret them as they want to, as we see with China, and no one kicks up a fuss. Um, and also China is succeeding massively based on this. It's not just that, but that is allowing China to just do its own thing. Um, think of what would happen if China just started imp importing hundreds of millions of Africans and Indians and and um, wherever else from the world. Think of the this instability and, and nightmare that that would cause in China versus what they're just doing now, which is working great. Um, that argument, it, the, the China question completely undermines what we have to listen to the whole time. And they're out there. It's almost like we're made ignorant by the fact that we don't have money or we wouldn't even be allowed into China. But, you know, they wouldn't want me to be able to sort of grab 20 people from the street at random sort of make my case to them and then teleport to a, a Chinese city and just look around and because they want everybody is so busy and so insular and you might go on holidays to Italy or you might go on holidays wherever but they don't want people to know what it's like maybe walking around Tehran or these are meant to be the boogeyman states walk around Tehran or as Tucker Carlson controversially did in Moscow and he sort of said it looked pretty nice and whatever um, Tehran or or Shanghai or even a second tier city in China, they wouldn't really want you looking at that, and because and, then you would start to think, why why do I have to live in such a shithole? Like why do I have to live in such decline? Why does it have to be like this? And start questioning the fundamentals. It's um, you know, 
they love to say that like the so-called racists in the West are culturally insular, but it's cultural insularity is what they depend on. And uh, I think we should be talking about the global context more. So anyway, look, I've rambled and rambled. And uh, I think probably the next night, I think more people are interested in current affairs. There's Kulak in Dublin. And I don't know how you even say it. Kulak, Kulak. Um, I'm not a dub. There's so much happening. And just to watch the the basically the daily goings on of Twitter or what pops up every day, it's fascinating what's happening at the moment. I just kind of wanted to um to to address this essay that I wrote and sort of talk about it um just because it's a it's a it's important so I don't know uh, I definitely need to read super chats because that's the whole point isn't it so how do I uh just bear with me there while I while I try to find them okay so thanks uh, any anybody who super chatted because look uh these are hard times for a lot of people you know um with the cost of everything and all that so you know i don't uh, take it for granted but uh, i appreciate the support as well at the same time and and people have supported me as well from my previous streams on like buy me a coffee and all that i really support, I appreciate it but i also don't uh, you know i don't expect anyone to ever give anything if it's tight for you or whatever i don't want to be like that i just i like i like doing this and i want to do it but the support helps that's all so um super chats so era only it gives five bucks and uh, just leaves the Irish flag. Emmanuel Godson, who, thank you for painting me. Uh, I appreciate that. Emmanuel's a great artist and um, uh, interesting mind and uh, kind of top guy, actually, um, who I've met a couple of times over the years and is always in the chat. I don't know if you're still there. Um, he did a painting of a lot of paintings of different nationalists and political people a few years back excellent painter and just uh you know i don't think he'll mind me or if you're there i don't think you'll mind me saying an eccentric type type of guy but like i think i, I had this conversation with someone earlier that some people are eccentric and they're out there and they're they're mad as a hatter in different ways um according to the average person this sort of like the normie will say but i, I remember th I, I was just saying to someone earlier that some people are a bit eccentric and a bit out there um, and have that energy, that eccentric energy. I will take that any day over like the, the normie who stares at you blankly. Like if you like if you're chatting to them and you don't get into a political ramble, but you just say um, you just kind of go, oh, things are kind of crazy, like, you know, some stuff or, the, you know, whatever. And they look at you like you've 10 heads and like you're offending some sort of like code that you're not meant to point out certain things and you know meant to talk off script it's like you know those people who you're at a barbecue with them on the weekend and everybody's talking like they're at work like oh yeah did you see the new recycle machines and the uh the uh the electric car there uh i got a grant and um what else do they talk about i don't know the match you know stuff like that i don't mean to be like rude but like you know um they um I'll take the eccentric mind or the stubborn person. Bill is another example, right? Bill Dwyer, a good friend of mine. Um, I saw someone criticize him recently on Twitter. I'm going to talk about that another night. I'm going to stand up for my man, but uh, from my boy Phil. But uh, Phil's one of these people who uh, who he's like totally stubborn and totally just follows his gut and runs into things and all of that. And some people some people then bring criticisms in and that um you and mckenna recently and others but phil's like completely sincere and real and uh he follows his gut and follows his heart on things and he doesn't sort of care what people think and uh, i admire that i'll take that any day over the person who's sort of like cookie cutter respectable but um completely shallow as well you know so anyway so a manual that's just a manual there uh he says keep it up garrod uh five euro thanks very much keep it up garrod uh know that we love you have a flask of tea on me i will kelly gives a tenor thank you and uh says great to see regular live streams garrod support from cork so yeah thanks for those um so yeah i'm gonna be back i think tomorrow night for a another live stream i'm just gonna talk about basically the goings on of the last week and uh do that so that should be fun i had to get this one out of the way it's a bit boring um i'm gonna do these kind of every once in a while basically and uh, 
I want to go back to the regular chat. Yeah, I'll do these every once in a while. But for the most part, I think what everybody enjoys, and I enjoy it as well, is just kind of watching the videos of the last, because every day it's crazy what's happening now. And uh, it's nice to be able to do it, basically. So anyway, look, I'll wrap up. I'll leave it there and say goodnight to you all. And thanks for watching. See you soon. Bye.